Welcome to the Ripple Effect Martial Arts Podcast. Hey everybody, really happy to have with us today, Bill and Connie Fisher. They are black belt students at Ripple Effect Martial Arts. I am happy to say I got to train alongside them for my black belt training. And Bill is a second generation firefighter. Connie is a incredible inspiration to her own family, but also to everyone else that she trains with and a huge inspiration to me. Thank you so much guys for taking the time out to talk. Thanks Mike. Yeah. Thank you. We're happy to be here. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> Let's uh, start out. How did you come to study martial arts? What made you want to train? I'll let Bill answer this one. First. <laughs> well, uh, I mean, I guess, I guess to go back, um, our kids started, we kept searching for, for interests and stuff that they were doing when they were younger, uh, take them swimming, ice skating. Elizabeth wanted to do dance one time, but we took her to dance class and she just sat there and stared and wouldn't participate or do anything. And so we were trying these things and we we're like, well, what about, you want to try karate? Should we try that? And they're both, yeah, yeah, let's try that. Let's try that. We went around several schools that were nearby where we lived and called them or tried to stop by and nobody had ever call back, return our calls. And so we were kind of like, well, now what do we do? And then we got this mailer for ripple effect um, to say, Hey, come on into the school and, and try, try karate. And Connie called on it. And I think 15 minutes later, master Macy called back and said, Hey, glad you're interested. Why don't you stop by? You know, we got the kids in it then went to all their practices, really enjoyed going to their practices, watching it and then sitting there going, this, this is probably something we can do. <laughs> I don't know why we're not doing it. And for me, I was standing there in, in the front of the Fort Collins um, school. Master Macy was talking to a couple of the, the teenage students that were all oh, purple, blue belt. And he was describing the black belt test. You know, it's the three days and we work you out real hard and make you tired. And then we're going to test you to see how well you can do it when you're tired. And, you know, it's just a, a long weekend and I'm sitting there. I mean, I'm kind of weird this way, but uh, that sounds fun to me. <laughs> I, I don't know how else to say it, but that sounds fun. You know, I, that may be the first time I've ever heard that, that you were someone was uh, excited about the idea of 72 hours doing push-ups. essentially. Does that come from a firefighter background at all? Is there any uh, analogy there? You know, I, I kind of think it does. You know, our, our current schedule, we work 48 hours. Um, before that, when we were looking at it, we were working 24 hours and it was every other day. So I'd work like a Monday, 24 hours, have Tuesday off, a Wednesday, 24 hours, have Thursday off, a Friday, 24 hours, and then I'd have four days off in a row. And so part of that was, is I'm already pushing myself, not getting much sleep at night, having to wake up from a dead sleep and function, I mean, be high functioning and decision-making problem solving. And so this, this kind of looked to me as another one of those challenges. Like I know I can do it for 24 hours. What about doing it for the 72 or whatever it is and, and push myself harder and can, can I, can I, can I do that? Oh, you've done it uh, at least four years in a row. I think I, Connie, what about you? What's your experience of, of the black belt test? Just go to launch straight to there. Yeah, I actually enjoy it. I was surprised at first, you know, like what Bill said, I, it really took a lot of convincing to get me to even get on the mat, but you know, watching the kids do their sidekicks on the wall. I was like, oh, I could totally do that. Psh, easy, right? Because I was hitting the gym, what, six days a week. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm totally fit. I can do this. I get out there and I'm like so sore from just holding my leg up. It was just a different part of, you know, your body that you're training. And I was just like, kudos to you guys, because that's amazing, because I could barely do it for like 30 seconds. And I my leg was down. <laughs> so <laughs> that took a lot of perseverance and, you know, telling myself, okay, this is going to be a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. The black belt test, I feel like, you know, just being positive. It's all about attitude, how you see it. You know, if you're negative going into it, guess what? Your test is not going to be very good, right? If you go into it as an open, just an open mind, you don't even have to be positive. Just have an open mind. 
just go into it. Just do what they tell you to do. Just do it. Don't question it. Just do it. I talk to my kids, especially the younger kid who's six now. And I say, just do what I'm saying, right? <laughs> and if you, you trust me, you, that's how you learn. And as adults, I was an adult, just like you guys, when mm -hmm. I went into this. And it, exactly, you listen to what the instructor is saying, and you do it. And there isn't a, a kind of question. Uh, and I feel like as an adult, I learned in that way. It's kind of interesting. So actually about your kids. So Gil is how old? How old was he when he started? Six. Six. They were six, six and eight. Yeah, he, he was okay. on the edge of being in either Little Ripples or, or starting out in White Belt. And they, uh, Master Macy put him in White Belt, and which was a good decision. He did well there. So. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth was about eight when she started. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So when they first came into the school, you, you know, that first lesson before you guys even started, what, what was what were they thinking or how, how did it go? Just the pure joy and excitement that was on their face while they were doing this. I mean, neither of them knew how to throw a punch. I mean, we've never taught the kids how to fight or, or to be, you know, but watching them throwing a punch and Gilbert's just bouncing up and down, so excited, having yeah. so much fun. <laughs> and Elizabeth standing there concentrating and, and hanging on every word and doing exactly what Robinson's telling her to do. And it, it was just exciting and fun to watch them. Um, they had a blast doing it. And, mm -hmm. and from that, there was never a question in their mind. Well, never a question in their minds that that's what they wanted to do. And that's what they wanted to move forward with um, just from that first introductory lesson. After that initial excitement had passed on into subsequent lessons, were there some trials? Did you have to push them to practice, do that repetition? Well, the, the very first class we did on the mat, Gilbert, we got to the edge of the mat. Elizabeth went sprinting out there like, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Gilbert went up to the edge and went, nope. And <laughs> we're like, come on, you gotta, this is where it starts. Like, nope, I'm not doing this. And so uh, Master Macy's like, all right, what if your dad comes out with you? So I went out with him mm -hmm. for that very first class on the mat. And ever since then, he was fine. Never any problem again, but... I know, especially as we progressed through it, especially getting into prep cycle and black belt, it did become a little bit more challenging to say, we have to practice. We have to do this. I, I know you guys think you got it, but we got to do it again. We got to, we got to practice it again. We got to rehearse the words, of the belt. We need to, even if it was just driving to class for the 20 minutes, let's at least recite something, recite the words, of the belt, recite the, the combos. You know, we take turns on the drive in saying, all right, you know, Connie gold belt. And then I do orange belt and then Gilbert to do green and purple. And we just keep going around till we got to class or, or, you know, we'd all recite it together just to help ingrain that in our brains so that you didn't have to think you just let your body do it. You just repetition, you just had it and your body just then did it. That's so interesting because I would do the exact same thing. The drive over was a crucial 15 or 20 minutes repetition repetition going over the mental aspect of it the the study right you you have to study your books in college and understand this material and the tests for your next belt rank are a little bit like that to me you have to study this material understand how to perform it and what it means and demonstrate it in front of people who are going to judge you going through fire academy was very similar to a, a prep cycle being that prep cycle is kind of boot camp-esque fire academy is very boot camp and so it was that repetition of doing things over and over i mean every morning we'd have bunker drills that's how we, we we'd go out we'd do our exercising for the first half hour hour of the day whether it was going out for a run, calisthenics, weights, whatever it was. And then after that, it was bunker drills. How fast can you get your bunker gear on from standing there in shorts and t-shirt to be ready to run in the door on a fire? And, and we would just keep doing that over and over and over and over again. I mean, to, to where you get into the end of the, the fire academy, you're just like, oh, good grief. What, why are we doing this again? We, we, we've done this every day so far, but you just keep doing it and doing it because it, when you're up at two in the morning, dead asleep, suddenly having to wake up and run out the door. 
you have to know how to do this in your sleep. And that's basically what they trained us to do is to be high functioning off, off little to no sleep or, or, or being dead awake or dead asleep to awake. Um, so a lot of that was through fire Academy that I can relate to it. Any of our other drills, ladder drills, hose drills. I mean, you, you'd spend days um, lifting, moving, carrying ladders, um, setting them up, taking them back down, walking them across the drill grounds, walking them back across the drill ground, setting them back up, taking them down again. And this all prepared you for also the end for, for the test that you had to do to get your firefighter certification, because then this kind of goes back to the test is we had what we call JPRs, um, job performance tasks, job performance requirements, something like that. You'd stand there and there would be I don't remember how many of dozen or so JPRs that we'd have to do. We'd maybe have to do six of them and they were randomly basically drawn out of a hat and we'd have to be able to, all right, you have ladders. Okay. And your ladder's sitting over there. I want it up against that building. All right. And you ran, grab it, threw it up. And they're standing there at their clipboard, making their marks and take it back down and they pull the next one out. And so you were kind of tested just like you were in the black belt test when you're standing there waiting and, you know, you're thinking they're going to go Chun Ji and, you know, go through the order. And then next thing you know, they're calling out Chung Mu and you're just like, wait, aren't we on orange belt yet? What's why, why are we so far ahead? You know, you're trying to switch gears and be, all right, I know that one, let's do this. To me, it's very relatable um, back to fire Academy. That was beautifully said. I have never been through boot camp or fire Academy, but <laughs> the stress of, and it's a good kind of stress, but just exactly what you said. I don't know what's coming next. And there are many purposeful interruptions. And the black belt te test up in Estes, where we were testing for our conditional black belts, I don't know if you recall, but there we were by ourselves while the the formal testing had ended, but we were doing exercises. Mm -hmm. And a fourth degree black belt came in the room. I didn't know him. And I don't think anybody did really. And he just started barking orders, basically. And we we did everything he said. And if one person in the group of 150 wasn't doing their push-ups, then we started over and started over and started over. And I remember yelling as loud as I have in my entire life, one, two, three, trying to encourage this to happen. And finally we got through it. But in the in the fire account i imagine it's the similar kind of thing there's there are the people that are in charge kind of the leaders and they're surveying the group of people who are trying to become to, trying to pass the test essentially and how do they do that I, connie as a as a mom and a kind of leader of your clan how do you do that for me it's just pushing through it myself. I'm me telling myself mentally, you got to do this. You know, I got to be strong for my kids, for my family. And I'm kind of like, I'm a leader anyway. So I'm just like, come on, let's do this. We have to get through it. I don't care if you're tired, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how I work. I don't know. I press, I push myself really hard. And so then I'm pushing the kids harder. <laughs> What's your background, Connie, would, uh, you were born in Taiwan? Yes, I was born in Taiwan. Um, I lived there for the first seven years of my life and then moved to the U.S., actually to Fort Collins uh, when I was seven years old. And I've been here since. And we moved to Nebraska for a little bit and then moved back. My parents owned restaurants. And so I was in the restaurant business with my parents you know, it's a family business, so you have to do kind of a little everything, hostess, waitress, cook, you know. Did you really do that while you were growing up? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Wow. Is there any kind of relationship you could you could draw between studying martial arts and, and going through these prep cycle uh, routines and learning these things and working in a kitchen, basically accountability, I guess, uh, under the banner of accountability. If you're working in a restaurant, especially for your parents, I imagine you had a lot of accountability that you had to learn at a young age. Absolutely. Um, you know, you have to actually get orders. You have to take the orders. You have to make sure you take the right orders and you don't take the wrong food to the wrong table, right? That's important to not do that. Um, you know, you want to make sure the food is cooked correctly so it's not undercooked, overcooked. 
Um, you want to make sure that, you know, you have your cut the customer service so that your customers want to come back and see you. So yeah, it's a lot. And, you know, with that being said, and with martial arts, I feel like that has a little um, connection where you just have to just do it. Just do it. I don't know. <laughs> For me, I mean, even just with martial arts, I just tell myself, you just have to do it. My goal was to get my black belt and then to get my name on my belt. That's my goal. Well, I didn't know that you didn't get your name on your belt until your second degree. So guess what? I went to second degree because that was my goal, right? And I'm not going to just quit because my goal is to get my name on my belt. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's weird, but. <laughs> no, it's not weird. I understand that totally. That's awesome. I, I, I think accountability organization and kind of people skills, It the people skills especially is something I never thought about when I got into martial arts training and the way that from the beginning of class, you bow onto the mat, you go and line up, you address your instructors as yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And that you hear countless stories of instructors walking into Seven Eleven or whatever and bowing like involuntarily basically, or saying yes, sir, to people at the, you know, at a restaurant or something. And those are good things. Those are things I really value uh, as having been through it myself and putting my kids through it. But for your kids, has the organization thing or the politeness thing, have you seen that come into play in their lives? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, especially with the manners. I feel like they are always saying, thank you, please. And we've had parents that have commented on how well behaved our kids are and what great manners they have. They're always saying, thank you, please. And helping out, you know, putting dishes away. Whereas most kids, they run off and they're like, okay, bye. You clean up my mess, you know, like not on purpose, but just, you know, that's just, oh, my friends are off. So I'm going to go off with them. You know, no, my kids will, you know, put their dishes away first before they go on and play. I've got a good story about that. Actually, when we were in Loveland for a black belt immersion some years ago, we was on the second day and we'd been up all night and we were going to get breakfast in the breakfast line. And I was right behind Bill and I'm looking at the eggs going, man, I can't wait. And you were getting your eggs and this one kid just kind of snuck up in line and just dove in, kind of wedged himself into the line. And I saw that and I was like, oh man, what's going on? And you actually spoke up in a super polite way. You said, hey, what's going on? And the kid goes, I'm just getting some eggs. And you said, you have to wait in line. You have to get your place in line. And I think that was it. And the kid just looked at you, but I thought, wow, you're brave to do that. I, I couldn't have looked this kid in the eye and said that. And <laughs> I was just really proud. And then I talked to Connie after I was like, wow, Billy really, uh, you know, set this kid straight in a super great way. And Connie was like, yep, that's how he is. <laughs> and I went, yeah, good for you. He says it like it is. Yeah. <laughs> Remember he that. doesn't mess around. <laughs> <laughs> it probably wouldn't work at the fire station. I imagine if some uh, new recruit came up and uh, budged into the, the mess line or something. Yeah, no, um, <laughs> not, not so much. Um, you usually don't have to be as polite there, though. Because <laughs> that's an adult, this is a kid. So, yeah. Hey, you know, we, we still, uh, yeah, it's, it's, we're still respectful and everything to each other. Yeah, don't get me wrong there. <laughs> but what does it feel like to have earned your black belt or to be, you know, a, a second degree black belt to, to continue training after earning your black belt is it what does it feel like it's empowering just to know that hey you know what i i hit my goal and i actually did it you know yes it was hard work blood sweat and tears that's for sure but we did it you know we made it through it and i'm very proud of our family for sticking to it and doing it together I feel like we're a lot closer as a family too, after doing, you know, getting our second degree black belts. I feel like it's, we're just closer because we have that in common. That's our bond. 
That's awesome. You know, in the blood, sweat and tears, just for anybody listening is not a figurative <laughs> part of speech. So on the, on the first eve of our official black belt test in Fort Collins, there were two things that I really remember distinctly. One was the hundred push-ups after we'd been working out for 20 minutes, probably as a group. And then it was a hundred push-ups and that was brutal, uh, really brutal. But I remember kind of, you were the, you were the last one and you were forcing your way through those final push-ups. And it was quiet in that room. It was hot, but everybody was looking at you and quiet, but just, I think, admiring, how are you doing this? You know, just squeezing that last ounce of strength. And then the test went on for another three hours. And then during that three hours, during the sparring, <laughs> I remember uh, Mr. Garcia, we were just in rounds of sparring in that long row, right? And we were jumping in, jumping in, jumping in and sparring, including instructors. And I think, Bill, you could maybe, tell, maybe I remember it better than you, actually, because you got really kind of nailed. But uh, it was a reverse hook kick, maybe, to the head. <laughs> and and you went down and came back up with a bloody mouth a little bit and cleaned up for two minutes and came right back out there. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, yeah, he, he but he had, he had kind of ducked down and did some weird where he was almost half on the ground, kind of up side hook kick and it caught me right square in the mouth. Um, caught my nose chin mouth i mean just couldn't hit it any square and knocked me down and jumped back up and was like what i mean i didn't even see it coming it came out of nowhere um i hadn't seen a move like that before and yeah like you said jump back up kind of thought my nose moved it back and forth it's like all right that's still in one piece i'm okay there you know ran through my teeth real quick mouth guard was in all right all my teeth are there i taste blood but let's wipe this up and let's keep going so that's what we did uh, and I think just for anybody listening to the instructors are good about judging what they deliver. And so, you know, you're someone, I think th that bout of sparring was pretty intense and it uh, you know, you, you were on the receiving end of, of that intensity for sure at that moment, but it, what does it take to get back up like that? For me, it wasn't hard. Nothing was broken. So make makes things a little easier to, to come back. But, you know, it's just one of those like, all right, you know, my eyes are watering because they got hit in the nose and the mouth and I just got to clean that up and give myself a minute. And I'm here to do something. So let's do it and get it done. If you're going into a, 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 a an emergency situation, like a, a fire situation, it, it sounds like what you just said was you're evaluating the damage essentially and your, your state. And if you're going into a fire situation, is that how it works too? You sort of evaluate what the dangers are and your capacity and things. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what it is. We call it the risk profile where, where you evaluate what the situation is, what you're going up against, how you're feeling, what your capabilities are, and you're making those decisions based on those factors of, am I going to run full headlong into this and, and do whatever it takes, or am I gonna stand back a minute, take an extra second, reevaluate it, or, or try something different? Maybe we aren't gonna attack it head on, maybe we're gonna stay outside and fight the fire, just because situation doesn't, doesn't lend to us going inside. It's not going to end well for anybody if we do. So we, we do that on every call, not just fires, medical emergencies. You're walking up to somebody and looking at them going, something, something's not right here. Something doesn't feel right here. And it, it's a matter of then, all right, how, how close do we get to this person? Do we even get close to them? Do we wait for the police to show up to help out? Do we, what do we do in this situation? So we're, we're constantly evaluating um, all the time on, on everything we do. And um, you, you go into work with bumps and bruises from something you did on your days off or even from training earlier that morning. 
you're you're constantly going okay yeah i twist my ankle a little bit this morning carrying that ladder but I, it'll be all right i can make it through anything we we can come up against today and and if you can't then you don't do it or you or you go home but you're you're constantly checking evaluating with everything what's going on outside what the fire's doing what that person's doing what the rest of my crew doing is their head in the game today it's it's just nonstop all day long it can be quite tiring after a while <laughs> <laughs> having your brain having to work so much and evaluate so much all the time. In a competition setting, it just kind of reminded me what you said about watching. You're sitting on the sidelines of the ring waiting for your, your turn to spar, for example, and you're seeing the other competitors and what they do. Do you go through that kind of a mental evaluation there, watching what other people are doing and what you will do in response if you're up against that person i i do yeah uh, i mean do you no, no. <laughs> <laughs> i'm oblivious i don't look, like pay attention he can attest to that but i've seen you spark connie and it looks yeah. uh pretty <laughs> so. she doesn't have to worry about it. it's just natural oh, stop. <laughs> <I don't want laughs> that. Uh, but yeah you, you're you're watching you the competitor is like all right you, you know this guy's throwing a lot of kicks or the, this guy's doing three moves yeah every time or whatever you're looking at he always leads with a punch or or okay i know i know it's this is what's going to come at me first um you also for me looking at how fast are they blocking or moving I'm not that fast, especially with my legs for kicking and stuff. So that's kind of what what also I'm looking at is if if I throw this kick, I mean, are they going to have 10 minutes to duck out of the way while it's still swinging around at them? <laughs> um, so I may have to evaluate and maybe all I throw is punches. So it's just, yeah, you're just constantly judging and evaluating to see what might work best for you. When um, Jeff Smith came in some years ago and said here's how you judge how to how far away to be what here's how you judge the distance from your competitor and it was the extended lead hand uh with their extended lead hand and that was so interesting to me just going wow just that knowledge alone makes me feel safer that i know exactly how far away from a person i could be without being in the range of their kicks or punches and that seems like a a kind of important thing for a, a firefighter to just to have an understanding of where am i at risk and what can i do yeah it's it's it, it, almost the exact same thing you're you're really judging the same thing as your capabilities based on the capabilities or whatever you're facing what, what you're up against whether it's it's a sparring match and you're going against in my cases everyone's two feet taller than i am so um whether going against them or whether i'm going into a burning building you know i need to know look at that building and know that i'm reading the cues in the outside of the building too i'm looking at the building saying all right that little window over there means that's where the bathroom is those stacks on the roof over there that means that's where a kitchen is or another bathroom is you know you're you're, you're getting these cues to to look at the building and evaluate it and go all right i know those just by this neighborhood those those rooms up there are bedrooms so that's where we're probably going to want to go first you're reading that you're evaluating it just like you would with sparring i look at that this guy's always either got one hand up or one hand down i know i can get that round kick in hit that side of the, of the head or he's always got his hands up i can hit him in the belly every time you know you're evaluating those things you're looking at them all the time so that you can make those decisions and and kind of plan your attack what would you guys say to people who are considering joining their kids on the mat or considering just signing up is earning a black belt worth it yeah yes. absolutely definitely yes. no you know, say there's no hesitation in that yeah, answer no. <laughs> it, it's worth every bit of it if if anything i mean it sh shows you what you can do what you're capable of it's also i mean for us it was learning something new too the only martial arts i'd ever been exposed to is what you see on tvs and in movies so mm -hmm. I, I knew nothing about it when we started the kids into it and so for me sitting there watching them that first year before we joined was just a complete learning experience and just taking it all in and just learning this stuff learning something new 
trying something new, trying something that's outside of your comfort zone, like we pushed Connie into doing, <laughs> it's it's well worth it. And it should be something that you you strive for, something you want to do in in whatever you do in life. Thank you for listening to the Ripple Effect Martial Arts Podcast. Find episodes and more at rippleeffectmartialarts.com.